Okay, so a little bittersweet. Our last topic uh, for the semester is rigid body kinetics. Before we get, before we get to rigid body kinetics, let's remember rigid part, particle kinetics was we were summing the forces in the x equals m a x summing the forces in the y equals m a y maybe it was 3d summing the forces in z equals m a z maybe we were summing the forces normal equals m a normal summing the forces tangential m a tangential uh, but we were all just assuming that all of the forces were acting through the same point uh, but really they may not be and so now that we have rigid bodies all of these forces may not be acting through the center of gravity g uh, and so how will that change things? We will still sum the forces in x equals m uh, ax. Sum of the forces in the y direction equals m a y. For 3D, we'll sum the forces in the z equals m a z. Many times those accelerations might be uh, zero. Uh, but now we have moments. And so now we can sum the moments. You know what sum of the moments is equal to? Uh, in statics, some of the moments was equal to zero. In many of these problems, some of the moments will still be equal to zero. Uh, but some of the moments, uh, instead of mass times acceleration, instead of mass, we have I. We have I, which is the mass moment of inertia. So this I will be the mass moment of inertia. Uh, it's almost the angular equivalent of mass. Uh, it's a measure of an object's resistance to rotation. It's a measure of an object's amount of how much mass is away from the center of rotation um, and how far it is away from the center of rotation. If you were in my statics class, we really compared mass moment of inertia with the area moment of inertia, not to be confused with those two. But anyway, some of the moments equals I. And instead of acceleration, we've got alpha, the angular acceleration. Okay, uh, but one thing, we need to be careful with these points um, because th this acceleration, um, if, if this is rotating, uh, point G might have a different acceleration than point A or, or, or point B. Uh, so this is the acceleration of the center of gravity G. Th these are the accelerations of the center of gravity, and this is the sum of the moment about the center of gravity. If we sum the moments about the center of gravity g, it's equal to i about g alpha. It's equal to i g alpha. Now we'll talk about some exceptions to this equation, or some, not exceptions, but um, if we sum the moments at a different point, it's, it may not be equal to i g alpha, but in general, sum the moments is equal to i alpha, but be careful about the points that we're looking at. So these are the accelerations of center of gravity. Accelerations of the center of gravity. Okay, now one thing that I like to uh, talk about we might see in some of these problems are, are wheels that are rolling. Uh, and many times wheels are either being pushed like the front wheel the front wheel of a bike, right? This wheel right here is being pushed from that point right there. That point is pushing it forward. And so I want to talk about friction. Let's talk about friction on wheels that are being pushed or wheels that are being turned. Uh, you might think that the force of friction, I, I don't know, what, what direction do you think the force of friction is on these wheels right at this point down here. Uh, you might think they're backwards, forwards. Well, the front wheel might be different than the back wheel. The front wheel is being pushed. Wheels that are being pushed with a force F right here. Uh, I've got a force of friction down here, but should I put the force of friction this way? Should I put the force of friction the other way? Uh, friction opposes relative motion um, opposes impending relative motion. There's zero. If this wheel is um, rolling without slipping, that velocity is zero. So this is a static, and, and so it's not really going left or right. Uh, but it opposes 
uh, impending relative motion. But the way that I would think about this is um, is is friction needed to cause acceleration or rotation. Sometimes this helps me. If there was no friction, then this force right here would 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 accelerate it forward, but there would be nothing that would cause any rotation. And so in this case, friction is needed for the rotation, right? If there was no friction right here, this wheel would not rotate. And I know that this wheel is rotating, right? A wheel that is being pushed, it is rotating. What if, if it's going forward, what direction is it rotating? It is rotating that way. So in this case, the force of friction will be that way because if it wasn't there, there would be no rotation. So th in this, in the front wheel, a wheel that's being pushed, the friction causes the rotation. Friction causes rotation. Okay, but a wheel that is being twisted, all right, a wheel that is being twisted, like the back wheel of the bike, when you're pedaling, or, or if I have some wheel right here and I, I give it a twist, all right, I would ask myself, is friction causing the acceleration or the rotation. So if I give this wheel a twist, um, it's going to go forward. Is friction causing the acceleration or the rotation? The moment is already causing the rotation, right? The friction, in this case, friction is what causes it to go forward. So my force of friction would be forward right here. In this case, friction friction is causing the rotation. No, 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 sorry. Friction is causing it to move forward. And we've got the force of friction right there. In this case, friction causes the motion forward. This is like your wheels on the car. You've got the the tr shaft that is twisting the wheels, um, and friction causes your car to go forwards. Right? Friction is the force that causes your car to go forward. So anyway, wheels. Just ask yourself, without friction, what what would what what is friction needed? What does friction do? What's the purpose of friction for this problem? For wheels that are being pushed. Friction is what's causing the rotation. So think about, I know what, which way it's rotating, and force of friction causes that rotation. Um, or the friction causes the, the car to go forward. Many times you will see it, you'll figure it out throughout the problem um, if you don't see it already. Okay, let's talk about I, mass moment of inertia. Mass moment of inertia is the a measure of the amount of mass and how far it is away from the rotating axis. It's really a measure of an object's resistance to rotation. Measure of an object's resistance to rotation. So the moments of inertia are given for common shapes. Um, we've got a slender rod. It's 1 12th ML squared. Um, about the g center of the slender rod the I about the end of a slender rod is one-third ML squared. So if, if we were twisting a rod about its end, it would be one-third ML squared. The I about a cylinder or a uniform disc is one-half MR squared. Don't forget about the parallel axis theorem. So if they give us the I about one point, but we want to know the I about a different point, we would add MD squared, take the I that they give us, but then add MD squared. Um, or they could give us the radius of gyration, K. All right. 
and k is a value that we can use to find i. i is equal to k squared times mass. i is equal to k squared times mass. So if they give us the k, especially if it's not a uniform disk, if it's not a uniform wheel, uh, they might give us the radius of gyration. Um, <clears throat> and we could do k squared m to get the mass moment of inertia i. All right, so now I said some of the moments equals i alpha. That's not exactly true. It's true if we sum the moments about the center of gravity. All right, so yes, sum the moments about the center of gravity is equal to i about the center of gravity times alpha of that object. It's also true if I sum the moments about a fixed point, a point that is not moving, for instance, let's say we've got a link that is pinned right here at O. If I sum the moments about G, it'd be equal to I G alpha. If I sum the moments about O, it would be equal to I about O alpha. And so for a slender rod, the I about G is 1 12th M L squared. Um, so I, I would, you know, plug in 1 12th M L squared. If I sum the moments about G, it'd be equal to I G alpha. Um, the I about the end of a slender rod is one third m l squared. So if I sum the moments about point O, it'd be equal to I about point O alpha. But if I sum the moments about a different point P, let's call this P, a point that is not the center of gravity and a point that is moving, then this would be equal to I G alpha plus, and it could be minus, m a d. This is the A of G. So if I sum the moments about a different point, it would be equal to IG alpha plus M A D. Uh, and D is the perpendicular distance from the acceleration vector, the acceleration of G vector to point P, perpendicular distance from the acceleration vector to point P. For instance, for instance, let's look at this one. Let's look at this one. Let's say we have a box and it, have, it has all these forces on here. Uh, l let's say it is accelerating to the right. Maybe this is sliding on the ground. Uh, it's accelerating to the right. If I wanted to, and there may be occasions where I will want to, if I wanted to sum the moments about point P, it would be equal to I G alpha. Now, if it is just sliding, it, it, that alpha could still be zero. Could be zero. If, if there's no rotate, if it is just sliding across the ground, it could be zero. But I need this M A d term and what is d d is the perpendicular distance from the vector from the acceleration vector so let's say this is point g my acceleration vector is right there the perpendicular distance from there to point p would be this distance right there that distance right there let's say this is three inches it would be that three inches right here. It would not be that five inches. It's got to be perpendicular. The distance is going to be perpendicular to the acceleration vector. <clears throat> perpendicular to the acceleration vector. And one last thing. We're summing the moments about P. If we have been summing the moments about P counterclockwise positive, then this MA vector and this D, it's almost like this creates a moment. It doesn't really similar to a moment. All right. And if we've been summing everything counterclockwise, this acceleration about point P, it's almost like a negative moment. And so in this case, we, we would have a negative MAD. So do that MAD as if the MA d was a moment and we've been summing the moments um, and so let's be consistent if we've been summing the moments 
counterclockwise. If this alpha counterclockwise positive, then this needs to be counterclockwise positive. And in this scenario, that would be a clockwise MAD, <coughs> making it a negative minus MAD. So this might be plus, could be negative. Depending on that MAD, does that create a positive moment about P or a negative moment about P? Okay, but let me reiterate. Let's circle back. We're still going to sum the forces in X equals MAX. Sum the forces in Y equals MAY. Now we're going to sum the moments. And if we sum the moments about G, it's IG alpha. If we sum the moments about a fixed point, it's I about the fixed point alpha. If we sum the moments about a point P, it is IG alpha plus maybe minus MAD. So we're going to start with some translation problems, okay? And in translation, in translation, alpha is zero. So some of my moments would be zero in translation. Some of my moments about a fixed point would be zero in translation. But if I sum my moments about point P, here's the important thing. I might, it might not be equal to zero, even if it's in translation. Does that make sense? Translation might still be, some of the moments might be equal to something if I sum my moments about a different point, P. Okay? Okay, so next thing we'll do is just start with some translation problems.